Great, and welcome to Bridges Live. My name is Dr. Paul Dyer. Why all of my video feeds come on, my live broadcast comes on from Apple iHeart and iHeartTunes and all those broadcast, broadcast channels. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Bridges Live. I'm Dr. Paul. We have here going to be talking about human trafficking, and I do the reason why I'm, I'm sound nervous because I'm, I'm I'm not really nervous, but I'm so ecstatic to have my beautiful friends on and people on Stacy Schaefer and, and and Beth Lithy. Please talk about what you do, and then we'll get right into what human trafficking is because it still doesn't get talked about. It still gets. It still gets pushed under the ground. And so please, Beth, first. Sure. Uh, my name is Beth Luthi. I direct the anti-trafficking program for the Salvation Army Central Maryland area. So I run a program called Catherine's Cottage, which is a 24-7 emergency and transitional housing program for um, adults, female identifying survivors of both sex trafficking and labor trafficking. And Ms. Stacy, please. Uh, so I'm Stacy Schaefer. I am from North Dakota. And here in North Dakota, I run an organization called 31A Project, where we really focus on spreading educational awareness on human trafficking, but also working with survivors, um, whether it is for emergency needs or let's say they want to share their story in some capacity or we're working on a public awareness campaign. We bring in survivor leaders because we really believe they're um, essential to this work. So that's a little bit about what we do. Well, thank you for coming on. And I, I, you know, this month is a lot of whatever month it is, the Black History Month and all that stuff. But I really want to bring this a light on to human trafficking. It's something that I'm quite passionate about. It's one of my soapboxes that I've been standing on for a number of years. But Beth, one of the things about human trafficking, labor, labor trafficking, it's just what is some of the factions that people just don't know that is happening? I mean, let's go with that first. Sure. Um, and and even just to, to create a connection to Black History Month, um, I think it's important for people to know, particularly with sex trafficking, that uh, women and girls of color are disproportionately affected. Um, so it, it definitely is, um, you know, I, an issue that um, that we need to be aware of. And there are, you know, a lot of reasons for that. And also I, I think sometimes um, girls and women of color are um, not so quick to be labeled victims like white um, victims of human trafficking are. So, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know, Dr. Dr. Dyer, um, you know, just to start with what human trafficking is, um, you know, a lot of times I think we think of it as an issue out there somewhere, you know, in another country, overseas. We hear about the way it affects people um, maybe outside of the United States, but it definitely um, is something right here in our backyards. And so, um, you know, it, just to, to also um, to clarify, you know, human trafficking is a crime that um, involves force, fraud, or coercion um, as a way to compel uh, people to do either forced labor or um, commercial sex acts. And and yeah, it's definitely something that happens, um, you know, here in Baltimore, where I live, um, and in North Dakota, and in in all. In all areas of the U.S., uh, both cities and rural areas. And in North Dakota, Stacy, the one thing we do know up there is that the Indian children, the Native Americans, they are disproportionately trafficked up there. You want to talk more about that up there? Yeah, that is definitely um, a trend that we see in North Dakota. And to try to combat that, we have um, specifically a group that works with the reservations to try to come up with a great response. So in North Dakota, we have something called navigators and they're spread out throughout North Dakota. And they are kind of our point people that help when dealing with these cases of human trafficking. And we specifically have a tribal navigator so that they can help assist us with kind of building that bridge as well. Um, both between reservations and then off of reservations as well, what those services look like. So we recognize it and we're definitely trying to do something about it. You know, this thing behind me is Warriors Against Trafficking, and that's a lot of my martial arts brothers and sisters out there who definitely teach defense and the action of human trafficking throughout the world and throughout the United States. And still, there's not enough hands in the pot to solve this problem. I, it, a direct question to you, Beth, is what's the problem? 
Like, we know that people are forgotten about, and that's why it's disproportionately between black and brown children. But what else is the problem? Is that we just turn a blind eye or we just don't give a damn? Which one? Uh, um, hopefully it's not the latter, you know, hopefully <laughs> some of it is, uh, you know, we use the, pr- the phrase hidden in plain sight. A lot yeah. of times uh, we just don't see it the way I, you know, I talk about this, this issue is in a lot of ways, um, the survivors that I work with were victims of the crime of human trafficking, but also in, in a lot of ways, just victims of life. And so there are a lot of of things that that cause um, people to be vulnerable. And we talk mostly about women um, and girls, but it's also a crime that affects um, boys and men and, uh, you know, people in the LGBTQ community are are particularly vulnerable as well. And so, um, you know, and I've I've worked with anti-trafficking programs in places like India where you could pretty easily point to poverty as the root cause. Um, in the U.S., it's it's a little more um, complex, you know, that I think we think about movies like Taken, and that's generally not what it looks like. Um, often <laughs> it's, you know, a girl who might um, not have a great home life, who doesn't feel great about herself, who, um, you know, is, um, is you know, uh, compelled through uh, a romantic relationship, you know, somebody who pretends to love and then says, I just need you to do this one thing. Uh, for a lot of people, it's it's connected with things like drug addiction, um, where those two things are intertwined. Um, and and so really, I, I think when we talk about what's wrong, we need to, to start a little bit below the surface okay. of what is it that makes people vulnerable. And I think that goes back to you touched on that a little bit about really just a broken family life. You know, that bro- and it's not just family. It's not just parent and mother and sister. It's broken love. Is that what you're looking at too, Stacey? Because I know you teach a class on this. Do you do you mm-hmm. teach that it's the brokenness of a person or the brokenness of a promise? Which one? Mm-hmm. Well, I think going kind of to what Beth is saying, like you just said so many great points there. Um, I, I think what we hear a lot from our survivors is they just want to be loved. Right. See? So what they're really missing is like, that foundation of what it feels like to ultimately be loved by someone else, which is why traffickers can take advantage of that so easily and quickly before you even realize it's happening. Well, yeah, I think too, um, looking at some of the systems that are broken that, um, that survivors are coming out of, you know, um, the foster care system is broken. Um, and you know, I, I hear lots of stories of women who come through my door who um, are victims of a broken foster care system or, you know, I think it's important to recognize um, a large, large number of um, girls and women affected by sex trafficking were first affected by sexual abuse or physical abuse or neglect at home. And so that... um, that sense of victimization began, you know, way, way before um, any any kind of crime that that could be defined as as trafficking happened. You know, and go ahead. Just to yeah, sorry, no. <laughs> and just to piggyback off of that, Beth, like when you look at labor trafficking, and I don't know what it looks like in your community, but um, you know, we focus a lot on sex trafficking, but right. on the labor trafficking side, what we have actually found for us here is um, a lot of people have this misconception that we have people coming in to our states illegally (laughs) when every single labor trafficking victim so far that we've worked with in North Dakota came in on a visa program and then was taken advantage of once they got here. So I think it's important to know too, like when we look at the visa side of things, um, there's over a hundred different types of visas that we're looking at and how could somebody use that system to their advantage as well? Right. I mean, we've we've had victims come to us through, um, you know, federal law enforcement who came, you know, as domestic help for for diplomats who um, wound up being domestic servants who couldn't get out of that situation and were were in labor trafficking through, yeah, very legitimate sort of uh, visa situations. So, yeah. See, some of these things, you know, we we have these news sources. And I'm not going to point fingers on 
all the news sources, but they're not doing their job either. I don't think so. When something like this is so diseased in our country and the world, and it doesn't even get a blip on the news channel, that must drive you two ladies crazy, because for me, it drives me nuts. I know it, it just does, because even the, even the crimes that happens to women in the streets and then the gang violence and, and all those broken issues affect so much of the community and none of it gets talked about. Well, I think it's kind of twofold, too, because sometimes even when we are hearing about it on the news or social media, the way it is being discussed is not always the correct way that then actually causes us more hardship for the individuals that are working in the field. Um, so messaging. Okay. Getting messaging, like correct messaging, I think is also a problem that we're dealing with right now, too, is, okay, if we're going to talk about it, that's great. But then how are we talking about it? And are we doing it correctly in a way that really highlights the problem? So what are some of those ways that we should learn how to talk about it then? Mm hmm. Um, so I, I think to me, depending where you're at, you should always go to the local nonprofits or organizations that are working in this field. Okay. Um, if you're questioning about some of the information that's coming out, ask them, ask them what they're seeing and what this looks like in your community. Don't just assume like what you see on social media, that that's exactly what it looks like. Mm. Fact check, fact check your information and make sure that it's coming from credible sources. So that's the first thing that comes to my mind um, when you're talking about the topic. I think too, um, there, there's a real tendency to sensationalize um, stories of human trafficking. And it's, it's you know, a tragic enough kind of crime that we don't have to sensationalize it. Um, you know, but stories like, you know, companies who are selling kids in closets through, you know, online shopping, that is not happening. Um, and so when you hear things like that, then you expect that human trafficking looks completely outrageous when often it it is hidden in plain sight. And often it, um, you know, it's it's girls who are going out at night to meet what they think is a boyfriend and then being um, trafficked and then you know, they, they're back in class in high school the next day, or, um, you know, it's, it's people who, um, are often ignored because, well, they just look like, you know, homeless people who, you know, are out on the street, but they're really, um, victims of crime. And so I, I think when we hear stories and we expect it to, to look like, um, a movie or, you know, some kind of really outrageous, um, sort of situation, then we minimize um, what happens in real life to real people um, in really horrendous ways. Paying attention, being aware, staying aware, but caring enough to say something. It really seems simple enough, but people seem to be so withdrawn into saying something. You mm -hmm. know, and it, they don't want to feel like they or could be wrong or to to be accusing someone to say, I just thought that didn't look right. You know, that didn't look right. I remember my brother got um, <laughs> almost close to arrested because when his first child was born, the child looked nothing like him. And when the child was acting up at Walmart, the, the, the police officer that was there said, this is not your child. And my brother got very offended. I mean, and I told my brother, I think I said, I said, they probably thought you took the child. They're like, why would they think I took, you know, they, they took the child? Mm -hmm. So I think people are afraid of being outwardly harmful in that way. Go ahead, Stacey. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's part of it. I think there's a fear of like, if I get involved with this, what right. could potentially happen on my end too. But what I often tell people is like, if something in your gut feels wrong, it probably is wrong. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing. There are multiple different ways you can report a case of human trafficking. If you are, are worried about going to your local law enforcement, you can use the tip line, the National Human Trafficking Hotline. If if you prefer that, um, like most states also have a state hotline. Some people are uncomfortable reporting through that as well. There are many different channels you can report and you can do it without saying your name. Um, and that tip is still out there. So we just really encourage people like you don't have to give your your whole history of who you are. 
but tell us what you're seeing so we can possibly do something about that. And just to, to, um, to support what Stacy said, that number is really easy to remember. That national hotline number is 888-3737-888. Uh, you can plug that into your phone. Um, as far as labor trafficking, that's one of the things that I think is certainly hidden in plain sight. Um, and there are numbers, and I don't have those memorized, but Department of Labor, um, Homeland Security has numbers that you can call. But, you know, chances are, if you go into, uh, there, there are certain um, areas of work that are are a little more known for uh, for labor trafficking. You know, if, if you go in to get your nails done and nobody speaks English and the, you know, it seems like there's a lot of control happening and people are not really allowed to speak for themselves and there aren't any, um, you know, licenses up. Same thing, massage parlors, you know, if, if there aren't state licenses up, that kind of thing. Um, and like Stacy said, if, if there's sort of that gut reaction of this doesn't feel cr- quite right, um, you know, call one of those numbers and um, and just say, you know, I don't, I don't know for sure, but just wanted to report this um, and, and let you guys, you know, take it from there. Now, let's get into the dirty, sad part about it. This is political or is it not? Ooh, I mean, in fairness, there does seem to be a pretty bipartisan um agreement that this is a crime <laughs> that is not a good thing um there you know there definitely is more of a spotlight on on sex trafficking than labor trafficking um with the labor trafficking piece when you get into um things like um t visas which is is a visa that allows um, a victim of human trafficking to stay in the u.s while that crime is being investigated um you know, it, those things um, are definitely a little bit more affected by um, swings around immigration um, and and ideas around immigration. But but I, I do feel like there is pretty good bipartisan support around a lot of anti-trafficking um, laws and policies. And what are you finding up there, Stacey? Do you think it's part of, do you think there's a political component in the neck of the woods in the, in the Dakotas? I think one thing people agree on, and Beth already touched on it, is this is a crime. Right. Like human trafficking, you're not going to be in favor of human trafficking. Or I guess I really haven't come into contact with someone who's like, yes, human <laughs> trafficking, you know. Um, but what you do find is how do we handle the issue is where I really see a lot of politics coming into place there. Um, how people think it looks versus how another group looks. Um those areas is where I see a lot of conflict arising. Um, and again, part of our job then is getting the right education out and pushing forward. And I know you have to leave pretty quick, Stacy, real quick. So what is yeah. some of those, without giving your personal view, what is some of the pushes that they are of how to handle it? What is the mm-hmm. conflict between a side and another side? Mm-hmm. If you could give me well, an idea. Right. Um, A lot of people um, assume trafficking does not exist in our rural communities. And we see it in our rural communities. We know it exists here. I think that labor trafficking piece is important, though, um, going back to what Beth said. It's not just people that are coming here that are random outsiders that are just showing up in our state. Um, We had to have this hard realization this past year in our state that 80 percent of the survivors we've been working with are North Dakota residents. So it's time that like we address it's here. It, it's not just those other people that are from other states or other countries that are being trafficked. So um, I think that's kind of our issue is just getting people to see that it's a problem here. People will address that it's a problem, but that it's a problem here takes a whole nother, a, a whole nother step in this. So in, in order to even solve or start to solve what's going on. Please give your last word about the, the, the organization you started and give that plug because I know you got to teach a class and I don't want to hold you up. Your kids be throwing erasers around the room, those nasty college kids. Uh, or they'll be happy. You know, you just never know, right? Um, but uh, yes, like I said earlier, I started a nonprofit called 31A Project um, from North Dakota. Our website is 31 31- aproject.org. Um, definitely check out what we're doing. We're doing a lot of virtual events. Um, in fact, we have one coming up Sunday where we're going to be talking about a, um, talking with a former buyer um, just because we want people 
able to understand all aspects of what this looks like. So we try to highlight this topic by inviting various different people from backgrounds to share what it looks like. So definitely um, follow us and um, just thank you, um, Paul, for having me on here tonight. And um, it's, it's been great. And I hope people are getting some good information. Thank you. So Beth, as, as we're talking about information, are we able to get more into schools and get this at a younger age? And how is that program looking? I mean, that is a great point when you talk about um, sort of the political piece is there are some areas that are um, basically mandating this kind of education at different levels. Okay. Um, and, you know, and some some people are doing that sort of across districts. Um, I. I definitely think there are some great educational resources out there um, that are age appropriate. Um, and, and that, you know, that kind of piece does, it, it is helpful to have um, political will around that. Um, so, so yeah, definitely, you know, education for younger people to let them know, you know, one, if, um, if a job seems too good to be true, it probably is too good to be true. You know, two, if somebody's and, forcing you to do that, something you don't want to do, that you know, is that not okay. Kind um, of that's illegal. Does, and and it, there it is helpful ways have, that you can um, seek out help. Political will um, on that. And, um, so, you know, the, so yeah, I think um, helping you know, educators at least be able to identify know, some red know, flags. One, um, if, you know, um, if when um, true, when somebody comes in your true, in your classroom you know, and if somebody's you know, they've got multiple you phones, they, they that, suddenly you know okay. um, have their hair done and nails done, and and there seems to be a lot of money sort of going into the way they look. Um, those those can be red flags, um, and so maybe teaching teachers how to uh, to ask those questions um, in a way that. Um, it's, that at least enables somebody to reach out for help. So, you know, when we teach teachers how to do anything, they seem very offended. Like, I have so much to do, and I got to do this. And you're like, I know, but, you know, this is it. it, it how do we get a hold of a teacher? And, and, I, and I'm not saying teachers don't care or people don't care. It just seems like, like another thing you're putting on them when this is part of all things. Right. I mean, in all fairness, teachers are completely overwhelmed right. and, and we do put a lot on them um wait till they have to start testing they're gonna watch we're gonna get teachers to start swabbing kids on their own watch <laughs> right right um yeah i mean I, I i think i think part of it is you know we talk about this issue in ways um that sometimes feels big and and finding those stories that help people connect it to you know the kid in their classroom and um and and helping them understand it doesn't always look like it does in the movies. You know, sometimes it's the kid in the back of your room who, you know, won't look you in the eye and is super shy and, and just needs help at home. Um, so, yeah. Is, we need volunteers for so many things. For, to run our community in a life, we just need volunteers. How can we help you help your people i mean do you need hand do you need food do you need subs i mean where can we help you help them yeah i mean i i think what stacy was saying you know um in in fairness i know uh nonprofits always say this but um but support you know money to help um put the resources together and hire the people to do the education um and then yeah, I mean, volunteering looks a number of different ways depending on the organization. Um, you know, I run a house, uh, and so we need people who can help garden and help mow the lawn, and um, and also, you know, people who want to come alongside and teach some skills. Um, you know, I, I do run a housing program, but. I'm really um, passionate about the idea that we need to do more than just housing. You know, if, if we're going to help people move toward a next step, toward an independent life uh, that looks different from what they were experiencing, they need a job. <laughs> um, and, you know, we need some business owners who will raise their hand and say, yeah, I'll, I'll take a risk on somebody. I'll hire somebody who has a record. You know, a lot of, a lot of people um, have criminal records that, you know, are related to things that they were compelled to do um, that were illegal. And and so, you know, finding people who will say, I'll take a risk on somebody 
Um, it doesn't even have to be a volunteer. It can just be a business owner who says, you know, I'll, I'll take a risk on somebody. You know, that's sad to me to think that um, it, it, of a person who's been misused, who has developed a record in because they were being misused, you would think, I w I'm thinking, how is that their fault? Like, how is that? I mean, I know it, I, how it's like, can, is this like a record that can be expunged? Like, okay, they, they wasn't, this was not them. You know what I mean? Well, and that's where the political will is important. You know, the state of Maryland um, last year passed a vacature law that does allow um, the vacature of, of some of those crimes, um, depending, you know, uh, depending on the level. But, um, and there are a lot of um, pro bono law firms that are, that are helping people with expungement, but it, that's the political piece, right? Is um, is making sure that uh, that the laws in different states um, help uh, victims, you know, on the other end who are trying to to do something different. Um, so, yeah. In, in in your home that you have, in the home that you run, there's a lot of black and brown kids there, mm -hmm. women, and it just is the number going up. Is it going down? Where are these numbers going? And what is the, because I know they're increasing. That's the sad part. I know they're increasing. So what's causing the increase? Is COVID also like another contributing factor? I mean, is, mm -hmm. is it part of it or is it just increasing? It's just increasing. I mean, I think the reality is there's a lot of money in it. You know, yes, traffickers are not motivated by hurting people. They mm -hmm. are motivated by money. And, um, you know, until... Uh, there are enough people who are prosecuted that it makes the risk uh, less enticing. Uh, there will continue to be traffickers who do this. Um, so, I, you know, I, I think the other piece sort of circling back is um, addressing the demand side, which I wish Stacey were still on here to talk a little bit more about that. When you said, you know, it's not their fault, um, there's still a real idea that um, it particularly um, sexual exploitation is a victimless crime. And I think there's some cognitive dissonance in there, you know, yeah. for buyers, they don't want to think that, well, this person is, you know, being forced to do this. So there's this idea that, oh, well, she wants to do this or, um, or whatever. And, and that is not generally the reality. Um, you know, the other piece is things like pornography. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, cell phones have made it really, really easy to produce pornography really cheaply. And a lot of what you see um, is actually rape on film. And so, um, and like any, anything that that's connected with addiction, um, you know, people want to see more and more and more. And so there's a real um, demand for uh, violent uh, pornography that involves younger and younger um, victims. And so we need to address those pieces as well. Um, and so maybe some of that's the education piece is, um, is educating people on just the realities of, of what this looks like um, and that for purchasers, um, it's not a victimless crime. When we could talk about education we could talk about a lot of things. I'm going to ask you about you. Are you okay? How are you doing? How are you? You have a family. You have a home life. You you have put your heart and passion into this, and you have to come home. You have to get in. You have to get into wherever you have to go. You have to get into the house wherever you have to go, and still be okay. So how do you do it? How are you? Um. Yeah. I. I wouldn't say I do it well. Um, you know, I mean, compassion fatigue is a very, very real thing. Um, and especially, I mean, in a 24, 24 seven um, program, there's always somebody with a need. So, um, I mean, I actually had a, a meeting with some staff today just to talk about how do we set better boundaries in terms of expectations, you know, of when we're available um, and, and who needs to answer those calls at different times. So. I don't do it well, but but I'm constantly aware that we need to figure out how to um, to set some boundaries as a program so that uh, so that we are ultimately healthy and able to to meet the needs. Well, if I could ever come in and help 
teach you guys the clearing meditation and clearing breathing and there's so really some amazing techniques out there whoever you get someone come in and help cleanse that cleanse you and so you can practice that sealing of that protection of breath that you can to keep your soul intact to keep your because we need you healthy because we need you out there it's 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 selfishly but i need you healthy so you can keep doing the work you're doing <laughs> so i will 100 percent take you up on that <laughs> please and then so because i just know i know i know so thank you so much how can people get a hold of you where can they help donate where can they help volunteer cut your grass Trim, or just volunteer to teach skill sets too. Sure. So Catherine's Cottage, you can find through the Salvation Army's website. Mm -hmm. So it's SA, like Salvation Army, um, hyphen MD, Maryland. Uh, so SA hyphen MD dot org uh, slash Catherine's Cottage. And it's C A T H E R I N E. Thank you. And I know when people hear this or listen to it, if they have any questions, please contact me, inbox me, and I can get it straight to Beth or Stacy so they can answer your question. And if you feeling heavy with listening to this, good for you, because I really want you to feel heavy. That's why I want to do this type of information and understanding, because we need your help. We just need your help. And and really just to end on a positive note, um, these are hard stories, yes. and it takes a lot for Sony to overcome years and years and years of trauma. Um, and, you know, I get to also see hope and I see transformation and I do see women who move through and onto something else. And so, um, you know, I, I laugh sometimes uh, and say that Catherine's Cottage is a program that nobody ever really leaves because um, we still hear from former, you know, residents and, even some who leave not on great terms, um, who then sort of pull things together and and text and email and call and say, I want you to know I'm doing well. Here's a picture of my baby. You know, we're, we're doing well. And so um, those stories, are, you know, are not always um, easy, but uh, but there definitely is hope and there definitely are women who are strong, strong resilient. Um, and I don't use the word survivor loosely, you know, no, they, no. you have to be really strong to be able to survive hard stuff. And, um, and there, there are plenty of, at least for me, I serve women, but, but men too, who are mm -hmm. coming out of, um, traumatic situations and finding, um, a life on the other side of that. My radio show, podcast show is always open to you, Beth. Um, we just, I love getting information out there for people. I don't think we have enough good stuff. And this is a good, this is still good, even though it seems heavy. This is still good stuff because it's information that you didn't know. So thank you so much. Many blessings yeah, to you, you, Beth. Thank you so much. Yeah, have thank you so much. And everyone have a blessed evening. Please stay safe. Stay masked up. Um, get out there, do the best you can, serve humanity, and stop serving yourself. And that's how I look at it. So God bless, Beth. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.